me with me today we are going to be having cliff muturi as our moderator today uh, he's an ophthalmologist and a colleague um, and he will be introducing our speaker for today dr munene and then um, we all learn what there is about orbital mucomycosis karibu sana daktari Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, good evening, everyone, once again. I hope you're staying warm and safe wherever you are. As you've heard, my name is uh, Cliff Moturi. I'm the ophthalmologist in Moranga County Referral Hospital. I've been there for the last uh, three years. Yeah. So welcome to today's session. Uh, today, we have the privilege of having uh, two speakers, Dr. Rhoda Munene, who has been uh, consultant ophthalmologist and uh, orbit and oculoplastic surgeon in KNH. So um, she's an experienced ophthalmologist with uh, more than 15 years of experience in both the public and private sectors. Uh, we also have a guest speaker, uh, Dr. Kennedy Koech, who uh, has not yet joined uh, the meeting, but he's scheduled to join the meeting. He's, an, uh, he's a maxillofacial surgeon, a consultant maxillofacial surgeon and Chief Specialist in KNH. Uh, he's also an adjunct professor in the Department of Surgery in JQuat, and uh, we'll be honored to uh, have uh, varied opinions on uh, this particular topic. So um, at the end of the presentation, we'll also have uh, a word from our sponsors for today, Alagan. So we'll give them a few minutes uh, to also tell us something about uh, their products. And uh, for now, uh, feel free to post any uh, questions or suggestions in the chat box as we continue. And uh, we, for now, we'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Munene to guide us through this uh, complex and rare but uh, interesting topic of uh, rhinoorbital mucomycosis. So, Karibu Daktari. Thank you, Dr. Muturi. Uh, what we are looking at today is, as you've been told, orbital mucomycosis. It's a rare orbital disease. Even those of us who have been in practice for long, we've not seen it. We've not seen so many cases. But with the advent of COVID, it's becoming an interesting topic. You read world over, especially in the Asian countries, and you can see it's what they are grappling with. Yesterday, there was a post in one of the international newspapers saying, India's black fungus, recovering patients grapple with eye removal. That's the extent of the disease. So I'll start with, you can see my shared screen, Moturi. Sorry, we can't see the shared screen yet. No. Uh, no, not yet. Uh, no. Yeah, now we can see it. Yes. The question we're asking is, are we ready if we reach where the other countries have reached, especially India? Not so long ago, you heard about the Indian variant in Kisumu. We might have it also in the other counties. And it's important for the ophthalmologist to know what to do. It's important for the ophthalmologist to know what to do. Like we've said, this is a new pattern of disease that we are seeing. There are no large studies done anywhere. There, are no, there is no standard protocol. If you try to read online, what you are getting is two, three cases, presentations done. The larger studies that are there are on mucomycosis before COVID. So we need to know where we are at. We need to know who has protocols and what are they doing. Dr. Munine, could you 
please go to slideshow so that we just have a bigger yes, presentation. Just a moment. Yeah. Thank you. So mucomycosis is a rare but a fatal opportunistic fungal infection. It's caused by fungus of the mucorosi family. The common types of this are the rhizopus and the mucous pieces. The mortality rate is up to 50%. That's why we find this an important topic. When we come to the clinical types, there is the rhino orbital cerebral, the ROC, which we are going to use as a word ROC from now on, is the most common type of mucomycosis. Others are skin, pulmonary, GI, and disseminated. In the severe cases of ROC, and we'll see as we move on, they not, they, they not only have the sinus and the orbital disease, but they have extensive skin involvement. When you look at the pathogenesis, in normal immunity, the spores of the fungus are removed by phagocytic leukocytes. In decreased immunity, the spores transforms into hypha, which invade the surrounding tissues, starting from the nasal cavity, to the sinuses, to the orbit, up to the brain. Overall, the vascular invasion results in thrombosis, ischemia, and necrosis. The necrotic tissue is from what we derive the term, the black fungus. The spread pattern is like we have said, it's from the sinuses to the orbit to intracranial extension. The contributing factors to ROC, diabetes, especially patients with DKA, even when we've seen it in our clinical setup before, COVID, we used to see it in diabetics quite a bit. Others are patients with chronic renal disease. In summary, is a patient with Im decreased immunity, patients on immune suppressants. I'll mention steroid use here. <clears throat> steroid use was not so widespread before, but with the advent of COVID, many people are just some are on precautionary steroid for whatever purpose. People are taking steroids at home, thinking that it's a prevention against COVID. Every other flu, when people get a flu, they are taking steroids. Then of course there is a therapeutic one. Then diseases like HIV, which reduce your immunity, PM for maybe patients on cancer treatments would also make you a risk candidate. As we've mentioned before, pre-COVID ROC was rare. The rise, the, the arising cases of orbital mucomycosis, especially in the Asian countries, the debate of why they are getting it more than we, whether it's because of their variants or the other factors has not been documented. But overall, there is a lot of fungal infection in the Asian communities locally. Locally, we've not had many cases. I've had only of two and the documentation was not complete. Knowing that we have said this is a very fatal disease, knowing that we have said that it's a disease which can rise in numbers as time goes, early diagnosis treatment of ROC is needed. We've already said that it involves more than one anatomical site, so it is an MDT-based treatment. And that's what we hope to go through today. Why do we need early diagnosis? A number of the patients with ROC do not present at the time they have COVID necessarily. A number of them present when they are already discharged. Then there are those present who present when they are under the care of the physician. Patients who present early have a survival rate of up to 75%. But patients who, prevent, who present from the 12th day, the survival rate is 42%. Some studies feel that when you get intracranial extension, the survival rate is 25% and below. 
This one we have already mentioned that COVID and ROC, there is a use of steroids. There is a pancreatic injury associated with COVID, making many patients diabetic. And in the presence of diabetes, especially DKA, the fungus thrives best in the acidic conditions thereof. The disease has a very varied presentation. There are patients who present with very subtle signs that you might miss, like the patient you see on this picture. Looking at him, you'd not know what is happening in the sinuses. Of course, we'll go to the details of how you go about it. The only thing you might see, probably mild hyperpigmentation of the lower lid left, but it's not very obvious. There are those who will present with the picture you're seeing here. There is a lot of inflammation. There is a lot. There is there are necrotic areas here. There is a chemosis. There is a chemosis. Then there are those who are at the extreme end, where you can see involvement from the maxilla from the maxilla to the orbit. You can see all this necrotic tissue in this picture. The presentation period, like we said, varies, and it also depends on who are they presenting to. Some patients, if they are already inpatient for the management of COVID, the presentation period might be seen early. But for those who have already been discharged, they will be treated for probably an orbital cellulitis. People may think it's just a consequence of the COVID they had without necessarily thinking of ROC. The common symptoms are loss of vision, facial swelling, pain, facial numbness, which is usually preceded by the stuffiness and flu. When you look at these symptoms, they can easily be confused with a patient with orbital cellulitis, but we'll come to this. When you look at the ophthalmic signs, they will look so much like you are dealing with orbital cellulitis. You'll have ophthalmoplegia, you'll have vision loss, you'll have proptosis, you'll have chemosis. This is in the order of frequency with the ophthalmoplegia being the highest. Facial paralysis, not so much. Two signs to note. The ophthalmoplegia in ROC is more than the ophthalmoplegia in orbital cellulitis. The hyporesthesia in ROC is more than the one in, in orbital cellulitis. Otherwise, visual loss will be there because of orbital apex disease. Proptosis will not help you to differentiate a lot between ROC and orbital cellulitis. Chemosis will also not help you. When you come now to the necrotic signs, they will help you because by the time you get the skin necrosis, skin necrosis is not so common with orbital cellulitis. The palate crusting will guide you that you are not dealing with orbital cellulitis. The nasal crusting and bleeding will guide you. The CNS related signs can be there even in a complicated orbital cellulitis. Like we said earlier, for the management of ROC, you need to have an MDT team. We'll mention the various people and what they'll help you to do. Radiologist is key because imaging will help you to, act, to assess the extent of disease. It will help you to pick complications and it will help you for surgical planning. Imaging the two modalities that we use a lot, we use CT scan and we use MRI. On CT scan, you will have a picture more or less, the picture of orbital cellulitis. Like you look here, you can see the sinuses are full. You can see that also. You have some involvement there in the orbit. There is a soft tissue mass there. This is a patient with a orbital apex disease with intracranial extension. Other findings on CT scan, which are significant, you can get bone sclerosis or 
necrosis. MRI, MRI may not be available in all our centers, but it has its pros in investigation for ROC. It gives you a better anatomic demonstration. It gives you better demonstration of perineural involvement. It avoids the use of iodinated contrast in the severely ill patients. The MRI picture of ROC is very varied. On T1 weighted images, you'll get some hypointense areas, hyperintense area. On T2 weighted images like here, you can see there is hyperintensity there. There is also more here. And the varied picture will be contributed to also by the necrotic patterns versus the inflammatory phase that you are in. That's why we are saying that even with contrast, you may get intense enhancement, you can get variable enhancement, or you can get none enhancement at all. You'll need a pathologist in your management of these patients. You'll need a pathologist in the general management of the patient when the patient is in the ward. Sugar control, you need endocrinologist. The endocrinology factors, you'll also need the pathologist for that. You'll need the pathologist when you get the samples for histopathology. The sites for your samples are going to be the endoscopic samples, if the ENT is doing first, the palate samples, the samples from nasopharynx, and of course, as an ophthalmologist, the orbital tissue. This is just a sketch of what to do with your sample. You've already collected your sample in theater. You'll divide it into two. The one to the left is what you are going to use for culture. The one to the right is what you are going to use for the fixed, for the fixated, for the slides for the fixated samples. Generally, culture may not be, it's good to mention this. Culture is not going to help you to manage a number of these patients because time is not your advantage. By the time you get this, a number of patients will have succumbed or their disease will have progressed. So you need the pathologist just to tell you about the immediate, about the fungal stains on the formalin slides. That will help you first. Then the pathologist, you need to make sure that the ones, the sample for culture goes to the lab immediately. That's why you're being asked you put it in saline or you put it in wet course and transport it immediately. This is the, a slide on HE. I'll comment on it. I'll first say why you need the pathology to fix, to do the slides for you. It tells you the morphology of the fungal element you are dealing with. They can tell you the fungal load. They can also comment about the accompanying inflammation or necrosis. They can comment also on the tissue of involvement. Why do you need a physician? You need a physician in the general management of this patient. You need a physician in the ra rational use of steroids. This is not our role as ophthalmologist. You hope the physician will be on board from the beginning. The indication for steroid use and COVID, we've mentioned earlier, there is a lot of misuse. The indication is still hypoxia and patients on inpatient care. Your physician, you need a lot of physician awareness because they are first line contact with ROC patients. The medical treatment that the physician will give you is general support of the patient, the sugar control. Medical treatment in use is amphotericin B or pocanozole or isovucanozole. Then you can also, you can use amphotericin B either systemic it can also be used as local irrigation in areas where you have already done the debridement. The physician will guide you on the dosages. As a surgeon, what is the role of surgery? There are no clear guidelines, but surgery has a role in debridement so that you remove the fungal material, the fungal load. The question of in ophthalmology, are we going to do exenteration or not? It's a big debate. There are people who are doing exenteration based on the degree of orbital involvement. I'm talking of exenteration versus just debulking. 
There are people who are doing exenteration routinely in every patient with orbital disease. The issue of a patient's consent comes in because the eye removal for exenteration, even in our general patients, it's a, patients are, some may not give consent. In some centers, they are saying that with the mention of exenteration, a number of patients decline and they go home. Some end up doing well just on amphotericin B, even without exenteration. Of course, others die. Then the issue of, are you doing debridement? Are you doing exenteration? You have to, come to weigh this against the patient's general status. Because if the patient is not fit for surgery, why are you being, even the aggressiveness will not pay at the end. The ENT surgeon is a first line contact with most of these patients because we say they will present with flu-like symptoms. The ENT surgeon will guide you and will support you, especially in face. The general feeling is that there is no need of extensive orbital surgery if the sinuses are not being circled because you are just clearing what you can see. Most of the fungus will still be in the sinuses. I put up this picture because we have a maxillofacial on board. I don't know whether Dr. Koech has logged in. Uh, not yet, but he's almost. He's almost. Yes. So I was hoping he would talk at this point before we proceed. So Dr. Kalu, you'll guide, guide us on the way forward. Um, Doc, I, I think if we could go on and then we'll come back to this point and uh, and he, he talks on it once he's joined, just talk to him, he's on his way. Hello? I'm saying you mm. could go on if possible. Mm. Uh, and then, because uh, he was somewhere and he's almost uh, getting to a place where he can log in and, and join us. Okay, just a minute. Because after this, it was just a conclusion after he talks. Oh, so I guess okay. you may have to go to chat. Okay. okay. Uh, maybe we could uh, have some questions so far for the presentation as we wait for Dr. Koech to join us kindly. Uh, maybe we can also uh, hear from uh, the other uh, orbit the other and oculoplastic. Yeah, oculopla especially the ones who are in this particular field who have uh, seen something that presents similarly but it's probably neoplastic or something totally different. And uh, what we should probably be more careful with while dealing with this uh, particularly aggressive and fatal illness. So I've seen Dr. Kabira is uh, somewhere. So I don't know whether she can comment or anyone else who is in the panel. Yeah, yeah, good evening, everybody. Um, good evening. I actually haven't seen any uh, of this of this orbital disease in this season, so I can't really say much about it. Okay. But thank you very thank much, Doctor uh, Munene, for that reminder. We'll be ready when they come. <laughs> uh, Doc, I need to ask. Uh, I make one comment. This is Doctor Akesha. Okay, Doc. It's okay. Okay, now the use of amphotericin B, there was a report some four weeks uh, back of sudden disappearance of amphotericin B in the Indian market in India when these cases came up. Mm -hmm. And um, they found that the other drugs were not working as well as amphotericin B mm -hmm. uh, when they had the mucosal involvement in the sinuses. Mm -hmm. Have you heard about it? Have you read about it? What I'm seeing is that most people are just using amphotericin B. Yes. The others have been tried, but no one is talking much about the use of the others. Because amphotericin because like, B, as I said, mm. suddenly disappeared from the entire Indian yes. market. It was not available. And they were looking for it from one person to the other. That was the worldwide, general worldwide. 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 They were looking for amphotericin B. Yes. 
And at that point, the rates were so high yeah. that after surgery, these patients were being sent to a physician's ward and the ophthalmologist would just come occasionally to irrigate for the Yeah, but then physician. the death rate on those cases had gone up to almost about 90%. Yes. And they would just do debulking or exenterate, leave a cannula, and then the physician would do daily flushing for them. Yes, yes. So they were looking for our fortalities in B a lot, but I've had them by Monday this week saying the cases have gone down. They have gone down, yes. The person That's in Mumbai was saying yeah. he's, Mumbai, one of the hospitals, a big hospital was saying he's seeing two to three cases per week, which is still high. Yes. In us, we have not seen any yet. There was one uh, area in uh, northern India, I forget the name exactly, but there they were seeing almost about 10 patients a week to start off. Mm. And then they've now come down to about two cases a week. Yes, but when it was so severe, they were looking for who can do exenteration in this area. And they did not have Enough adequately people. trained people to do the exenterations. Even maxillofacial surgeons were doing exenterations. General surgeons were doing exenterations. I can Neurosurgeons were doing exenterations. Yes, yes, absolutely. It was that severe then. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. No, we asked, okay. Okay, you can still continue to uh, ask the questions. <laughs> to of engage us with for Dr. Koech. Yeah. The other thing that they were debating a lot, because I could see like when people, you've seen the kind of picture I've posted. The person who posted that picture was being asked when you go up to the, you can see they've gone up to the temporal fossa. Are we spreading infection? And what is the state of that patient at the end of it all? And if we, because it's just a justification. By the time you do this, the mortality is also likely to be very high because of the extensive involvement. Dr. Nyanza, are you here? Yes. Anyone yes, else I'm who has seen a case? Yes. Have you, I, seen, have you handled any with COVID? No, um, with COVID, fortunately not. The only case we handled in Kenyatta, I remember, was like two or three years back. Two or three years it was, back. Uh, yeah, devastating. The patient had the intracranial orbital, I, they call it rhino orbital cranial mucomycosis. It had extended all the way to the brain. Mm -hmm. And the uh, bulking was almost, it, actually, the bulking was uh, impossible. So it was impossible. Yeah, I tried uh, IV antifungals, uh, aphotericin B, for almost like two weeks, but the patient succumbed to the disease. She came when it was already too late. So, as you said, this disease, the most important thing will be to suspect, and especially if you see a necrosis and a patient is diabetic or some uh, or, or as a chronic especially think condition like renal failure acidosis yeah. from anything now covid then you should have an eye index of suspicion because that can save a life when it is extensive uh you it, it can result to such kind of aggressive surgery that i've seen the picture there i'm sure doctor going to uh, bring an insight but even uh, the mortality is very high it's very high if you get up to the orbital apex, for most studies, they will tell you they are, you are at over 75%. Yes, yes, yes. That's true. So this is a very, it's, it's always up to, good to have a high index of suspicion uh, for this condition. So it's important. Thank you very much for this topic. It's a good one. To sensitize also our ENT colleagues and our physicians. Yeah, right. You're right. It's true. Thank you. Sorry, I can see a question somewhere. Okay, you've asked a question, Dr. Momani. How do you explain the high incidence rate of this condition in India and like in our setup? I've seen this discussed and I think 
positively and negatively. There is a time uh, one of the international media made a comment that was not very well accepted of why you have it more in India. But when you see the objective discussions that people have given, it's either that we've always had more fungal infection in India, more diabetics in India, or some other unknown factors. I remember there is a point someone was asking, is, are we using contaminated swabs when they do the nasal swabbing for the COVID test? Someone was even asking, are they using contaminated swabs and that's why you have such high rates? Again, it was no. I think it's just they, are, they have a lot of fungal disease and they have a lot of diabetics. And of course, COVID is more there, was more there at the point they were having it, having more cases. Okay, that's a, um, a good uh, start to uh, the, the, the entire discussion. Dr. Koech is uh, joining now. Okay. Um, so uh, let's give him a few minutes. We can continue to post any remarks or any questions still in the chat box. Um, there, was, there was also, just a, wanted to make a comment. Yes, yes continue. There was a suggestion that uh, the nasal prongs and the tubing for for patients receiving oxygen. Okay. They were getting contaminated or somehow, or they were just, it was another place, it was another way that they could, uh, the, the infection could spread. I don't know whether that was what proved or anything. That was one of the uh, theories that I it's heard. It's possible. Yeah. I'm just thinking <laughs> even here, do people clean this or prongs a lot? Yes, I think they have to sterilize. I think they, they have, have to sterilize them. Sterilizing solutions, yes. Because that could contribute because one mm -hmm. person I know strongly felt it was the swabs. The ones that they were using for swabbing, but again, that was dispelled. Yeah, another comment I wanted to make is um, I've managed a patient who was diabetic who had this infection many years ago. Mm -hmm. And I remember we went in and debrided conservatively and we didn't get a good enough response we ended up having to exenterate so i think sometimes it's probably just worth going for exenteration i'm, I'm you know I, I, Ali, that's what i would do so as because if the ent is doing first you'd go yes. for the exenteration at the same sitting yes. yes we did it we did it we did it we did it. we did the proceed the both procedures because i went to the ent surgeon okay. and the patient survived it was a young man who was a diabetic so I've also seen a teenager a diabetic who survived. Dr. Walia is asking, I think this is to everyone. Any comments about the way oxygen is given to patients via a water bath rather than directly as we do here? I would ask for assistance to answer this question. Anyone with an idea, with the answer can help us. So anyone who um, uh, has the answer can unmute and talk. Um, maybe, uh, I don't know whether this, as you had said in your presentation, uh, mm. the biggest risk factor um, is immunosuppression. Mm. So, uh, maybe the introduction of uh, this fungus, because you said there are spores in yes. the water and in the containers that are used as the humidifiers can by itself be a risk factor for these patients. So yes, I think in some setups, maybe it could lead to development of this disease. Yeah. Okay. Uh Dr. Jafaji is asking if could climatic conditions would and congestion would have a role to play. I believe so. It would have a role to play in the in the fact that these are viral disease that will spread more with the congestion. But again, maybe the the clim the humid climate, which is what you are inferring above, would contribute.
And uh, Dr. Wally, I've seen your, your comments that people believe that the water bath was the main contributing factor to having more cases in India. Uh, Doc, I can comment on the fungal infections in India. Mm. Right from the time, 70s, when I was a student there of ophthalmology, the incidence of fungal infections is much higher in India, partly because of the temperature conditions and the it was playing a very important role in this. You will find the fungal infection, the mucormycosis is also occurred in areas and in temperatures where the humidity has been much higher, Delhi, uh, Mumbai, and other areas in Western India. But as you go down South, mm. where the humidity was less, the cases of uh, incidence of mucormycosis was much lower. So it's the humidity then? It's the humidity factor. So should we, exp should we have expected to see more fungal disease in the more humid parts of Kenya then? Yes, that's right. Okay. I see Dr. Masila, Dr. Masila has also asked how common the condition is in children. So um, Dr. Kabiru had, uh, and Dr. Munene had said they had seen relatively younger patients who are diabetic and who presented with a condition. So uh, maybe, I don't know. Uh, I think it depends on the immunocompetence. So I don't know that Dr. Munene, you have seen children? I'm not seen in a child. Okay. And I've seen uh, Prof has written that uh, the defect that would be created by Part of it be, was to yeah. raise the fascia. Yeah. Part of it was in dissection of the patient from the explanation given then, the bulking then. Okay. Prof, have you seen any case? He's muted. Eh? We're still trying to reach uh, Dr. Kwech, who is the last message it said he was joining. So let me just yeah, I, I, I've just joined. Eh? Just joined. Ah, okay, yes, just okay, joined. good. Yeah, I've just joined. Dr. Munene could share the screen at that point of the, the patient after debridement, please. So that we continue. Mm -hmm. Just a minute. Uh, Dr. Koech, we had discussed the management by various disciplines. Yeah. And we had come to the point of uh, saying that you need a maxillofacial surgeon. Mm. And we were hoping that you'd give us your comment as a maxillofacial surgeon in the management Fine. of ROC and COVID-19. Okay. Or Maybe even in the management of ROC in general. Mm. There was a, a picture that you were supposed to to share. Eh? Yeah, this one. Yes. Um, so this is at what stage now, Dr. Munene? Uh, is this it was, debridement or what? This was after debridement. This because was a I can see the flaps from... are open. Oh, this is a picture from elsewhere. It's a picture from elsewhere. Ah, okay, okay, yes. I get you, I get, I get you. Because uh, even I, amongst well, us ophthalmologists, Dr. we have not handled this time. 
I haven't also seen it. Uh, I think I had uh, told you about it uh, yes. earlier. I, I hadn't seen this this uh, this infection uh, in in COVID. And if, if, if it, even without COVID, I think you people tend to see it a little bit uh, more frequently than than us in maxillofacial for the because of orbital involvements. But uh, I think we can say, fortunately, we have not seen it because I'm just trying to imagine that uh, for how long will you be will 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 you do medical management for this before deciding on. Um, on, on reconstruction. What, what's your what's what's your view on, or what what parameters would tell you that uh, the that, that you've cleared the mucomycosis? When you when you're talking of surgical management, the surgical management to reduce the fungal load. Hmm. Yeah, but then before you you embark on uh, on any reconstruction of mm -hmm. lost tissue, mm -hmm. we, we then need to be sure that uh, the infection has been cleared. Mm -hmm. what, what, what parameters are we going to use to, to declare that the, the infection has cleared? Are there, do we need to do cultures or, or what, what, what parameters will we use? Because my fear is uh, trying to do a reconstruction on on tissue that that is that still has the the fungus and the the infection would, would would still continue. What about the helping in the debridement? Yeah, debridement, of course. Because, uh, like you can see, mm, this one has probably had a maxillectomy done. Yes, it yeah definitely maxillectomy has been done. I can see the where the saw went through, but. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't even know the prognosis of, of this if, if we can't be sure that the infection has been uh, eradicated. Because so if, I, if infection has been eradicated, then, then mm -hmm. we, would, uh, we would think about a definitive uh, reconstruction mm -hmm. based on the, 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 the types of tissue that, that have been lost. So if uh, obviously I'm, 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 I'm sure there'll be soft tissue and also bone loss in a situation like this. So we would need to, to embark, we would have to use a free flap in this case, which will come with a soft tissue and also a bone component. But you see, we have to do this when we are so sure that now there is, there is no more infection because the, the reconstruction, the flap would, ju would just hide the, the, the infection, fungus. yeah, which would just continue uh, going on be beneath. So you see know. your role as more in the debridement process primarily. Reconstruction much later. Yeah, you see, reconstruction will really depend on uh, on, on 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 the outcome later. Uh, how how is the, the infection? Because if if we'll have money to control the infection, then it will make sense. But uh, if, if infection will still be uh, questionable, then we'll probably so delay the reconstruction. Yeah, we'll probably delay the reconstruction. So this is a case from, uh, from what, India? From India. Yeah. Well, um, and you people haven't seen it. No, I've not be... seen Dr. Nyenze has not seen, Dr. Kabiru has seen, Doc, Dr. Ashira has not seen. Dr. Kabiru Dr. has Kab not seen, has, has seen earlier. Seen. So, uh, without, but in, in a non-COVID situation? In a non-COVID situation, maybe you see one, two years or so. Hmm. So these are extremely rare situation, uh, conditions. So, uh, in maxillofacial, we actually hardly see it. I think uh, there was one case that we thought it was in the ward. I'm not sure that it is. It's a guy who came from Northern Kenya and it was involving everywhere, including the, the orbit and the, and the maxilla, the soft tissues. But we were still treating the, the infection and, and, and doing the debridements. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, so I think if, if it presents, then the, the thing that we should concentrate on a little bit more is, is the, the debridement and controlling the infection. Hopefully, if we can get rid of the infection, then we start planning the, the reconstruction bit. Thank you. Yeah, and that means then we'll have to come together with the uh, with you people and probably uh, a neuro also and and maybe plastic. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Doctor Koech. Um, yes. It looks like the the message is clear that uh, first of all the disease is rare uh, having surveyed uh, most of us uh, particularly orbit endoculoplastic surgeons who are uh, the first contacts for patients who present with such a condition and it's already rare even uh, in their circles but uh, it's fatal which is even more important than its rarity in uh, as dr munene had said patients who present Within six days of a survival rate of more than 75%. Thereafter, the rate just continues decreasing. So uh, when you see it, just have a high index of suspicion. Involve uh, as many of the people who are in the multidisciplinary team as you can get so that uh, the management can be tailored to the patient and to how much the disease has spread. As uh, Dr. Munene also alluded to, uh, earlier, some patients uh, hear the, uh, the process of exenteration and they decline and they prefer to just have the disease uh, have its way other than have half their face removed. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's a rare condition, but uh, its effects are, uh, are really bad. So um, I don't know that there are any other questions uh, from anyone in attendance. Or any comments? There's okay. a, a one comment up, Dr. Maybe you can take a look from Dr. Walia. Dr. Cliff, there's a comment from Dr. Walia. On oh, yeah, I've, I've seen it. Yeah, I've seen it. So, yeah, he says uh, that a wound that shows no fungal infection, no signs of fungal growth, uh, either by repeated culture or wound inspection, would give a fair idea about the control of the infection. The problem here is, yeah, how fast the disease progresses, particularly considering uh, the immune immunosuppression in the patients that it affects. So thank you for your comment. That's, that's true. So you can institute treatment uh, early, but uh, the disease might spread a bit faster than uh, the rate at which you're treating it. Thank you for your comment. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay, uh, good. So I'd like to thank the presenters. Uh, thank you, Dr. Munene. Thank you, Dr. Koech, uh, for uh, taking your time to share the knowledge and the ideas concerning this uh, condition. Uh, thank you for the insight and uh, for reminding us that uh, in as much as we don't see it, it still exists. And we may end up seeing more of it as we continue to manage patients who are um, affected by COVID and patients who are on steroids. And uh, thank you for also the data that we've got from uh, India in particular about uh, the risk factors. Maybe at some point, uh, these risk factors may apply to uh, some regions in the country, some hospitals. So we need to be vigilant whenever we are managing our patients. Thank you once again. So um, if there are no uh, other questions uh, concerning this particular topic, uh, before we invite uh, our sponsors for the day, I'd just like to uh, mention uh, something that uh, will be of importance to the entire fraternity. 
uh, there was a meeting today in the morning on uh, development of a formulary, a drug formulary that will be used uh, in Kenya. So up until a few weeks ago, when Dr. Korir had uh, posted on the group uh, about some essential drugs that are needed, I, I didn't know that uh, we didn't have a formulary for ourselves. We've been using uh, borrowed uh, formularies from Britain, from uh, Nepal, from India. So uh, the Ministry of Health is coming up with uh, an initiative to develop our own formulary. So based on that, um, the template is what had been shared on the group earlier, where uh, particularly on uh, ophthalmological drugs, page 95 of the document that was shared, uh, the drugs are few, very few, considering what we use every day. So uh, what was decided is that uh, we as a, a group of specialists need to come up with uh, a list of uh, more of these drugs. So uh, we need to come up with the drug name, the recommendation, and the level of use. Uh, can it be used, should it be used in a big hospital, for example, a level six? Can it be used in a level two hospital, a health center? And uh, we need to do this uh, in two weeks so that we hand over a draft document to the Ministry of Health. So uh, we, in consultation with Dr. Korir, we thought that uh, it would be better if uh, doctors from uh, different subspecialities could come up with a list. For example, uh, the glaucoma specialist can come up with a list of what they think is key to add in this list. Uh, the retina specialist, the anterior segment, or anyone else, so that uh, in two weeks we'll be able to come up with at least a draft of uh, anything that we need to add to that list. Uh, preferably, we can put these drugs in the categories that have been given. Um, so I don't know how, whether we can be able to access that document, because the categories that have been given are, uh, uh, you know, infective, anti-glaucoma, something like that. Eh? So let me just go to the document so that we can be on the same page. So if you can open that document on page 95, the document that was shared on WhatsApp. Uh, yeah, so uh, there are anti-infective agents, anti-inflammatory agents, local anesthetics, myotics and anti-glaucoma medicines, mitriatics, antivascular, anti-VEGF medication, or preparations, anti-allergy, other medicines for the eye. So as you can see, the list has very few uh, medicines. So we try to come up with a, a way of uh, including or increasing this list. Uh, they'll share a draft of how we can do that. They said they'll share that draft by Monday. So I'll be in touch so that we can see how we can make a more concise list. Uh, so uh, we'll try to come up with a way of doing this uh, in a more objective way, at least and communicate to the group before Monday, or hopefully after Monday, after we get the draft of how to do this. So yeah, with that, uh, I'd like to invite uh, John, who, uh, I don't know whether he has uh, logged out. John, are you? Okay. Hello? Hello, yes, we can hear you. I'm in, but uh, yes. Annette is going to play to do the presentation. Okay. Annette, please. Okay, Annette. Okay. Oh, yeah, um, good evening, everyone. My name is Annette Ofete. I am representing Alagan this evening. I would like to start by um, thanking the association for giving Alagan yet another opportunity to partner with you this evening. And today we would like to focus on Optif Fusion. Uh, which is uh, which is a range among the Octi family. It's a superior lubricant, and basically because it has hyaluronic acid in it, which makes it offer extra uh, moisturization for your dry eye patients. And Alagan recommends this for uh, patients who have severe dry eye disease. So just as a reminder, we will run a short video to just explain the mode of action and its benefits for your patient. 
So if you have um, challenges to listen when you're listening to the video, just try and increase your volume to the maximum. And then I'll take questions after the video. Um, I can't seem to hear anything, so I'm assuming maybe also no one else can hear it. Yeah, there's no sound. Yeah, yet. there's no. Yeah, there's no sound. Annette, can uh, can it be shared with uh, Evans? Um, I don't know if Evans is having a challenge because we tested it and it was okay. So. Is Evan seen? There is an audio, I but it's I do not get the video. To musings. It also has advanced lubrication. The video. Okay. Please stop the video. Here. Okay. Sodium carboxymethyl cellulose CMC is a proven polymer that is widely successful in treating dry eye. Today At some point you could hear, but I think the audio is lost. Or maybe you can just uh, talk through the presentation. Hello? Hello? Annette? Annette? Yes, yes. Uh, I think we have a problem with the... With the with the uh, volume, audio, audio mm -hmm. part of it. So can I also try on my side, just see if it will take a minute. Maybe stop sharing and I just try my backup. I see whether it will work. Okay, okay so if it doesn't, then I can just go through it first. Okay, let's, okay. Let me try first before you. Can I stop from my end? Yes, yes, I think you have to stop it. Annette, maybe you could just uh, talk through the presentation for us if the video is still a challenge. Sodium carboxymethyl cellulose CMC is a proven polymer that is widely successful in treating dry eye. Today, a good thing has become even better with the proprietary combination of CMC and sodium hyaluronate, a derivative of hyaluronic acid HA, into a single artificial tear formulation. 
Together, these two leading polymers produce a unique dry eye treatment that delivers improved clinical benefits for dry eye patients, including a reduction in ocular surface staining that is better than a product with CMC alone. CMC is a water-soluble polymer derived from cellulose and in comparison to HA is a relatively short polymer. CMC is effective in artificial tear formulations because of its mucomimetic properties, which allow it to successfully bind to mucin. It also has advanced lubrication qualities. Uniform, long, and coiled, HA is a glycosaminoglycan naturally found in the eye. HA is known for its sheer thinning properties and for its ability to promote cell migration and retain water. Through advanced research and development, Allergan accomplished the complex task of combining these negatively charged polymers, CMC and HA, into a single dropped formula. This breakthrough formulation allows both CMC and HA to maintain their own individual characteristics. Yet by forming a bridged matrix, they perform synergistically when combined. The CMC-HA combination helps relieve dry eye signs and symptoms by providing the lubrication and water retention that comfortably protect the eye and then promoting cell binding that enables cell migration to help restore surface integrity. Together, this protection and restoration assists with ocular resurfacing. Here's how it works. In dry eye, the tear film is compromised. It breaks up more rapidly, decreasing the quantity and quality of human tears. CMC has optimal cell binding properties, and HA has demonstrated ability to retain water. The CMC-HA bridged matrix allows HA to remain on the eye. This maintains surface hydration, which expands the protective layer on the ocular surface. This water retention helps to relieve dry eye symptoms and protect the eye from adverse environmental conditions. Compared to HA alone, the CNC-HA combination provides a boost in viscosity between links. This viscosity boost allows the combination of polymers to further protect the ocular surface by stabilizing the tear film without inducing blur. During blink, the viscosity of the CMC HA bridged matrix is significantly reduced by a sheer thinning. Notably, this viscosity during the blink is similar to that of HA alone. The cumulative result is ocular surface protection through tear film stability between blinks while delivering a smooth, comfortable blink. <coughs> now that the protection mechanism is in place, the combination of polymers can go to work to promote healing. The tear film and epithelial cell surface contain mucins that are important for tear film retention and lubrication. The bridged matrix of CMC and HA allows the combination of polymers to adhere very effectively to these mucins and damaged areas on the ocular surface. This mucoadhesive anchoring provides an opportunity for restoration. The CMC and HA combination can now stimulate healthy epithelial cells that can efficiently migrate to damaged areas where healing can occur. The restorative effects of this artificial tear formulation assist in increasing the microvilli that help the ocular surface to better hold on to the tear film. This results in improved tear film quality and uniformity, which aids in visual function. The combination of CMC and HA into a single drop delivers cumulative benefits for the treatment of dry eye. The polymers work together to assist with ocular resurfacing, comfortable protection that enables effective ocular surface restoration. Okay, so that's it. Um, so in summary, basically, uh, what it means is that Optifusion is superior because 
there's very good synergy between the CMC and the hyaluronic acid. Therefore, um, it offers better healing properties when it comes to the mucolytic property, lubrication, and also um, cell binding. So at the end of the day, the patient will actually have a much healthier tear feeling. And um, unless there are any other questions, that would be it from Aladan. Any questions? Okay. Thank you, Annette. Um, thank you, Alagan, for the sponsorship and the and the support. We value your support. Uh, with and um, thank you, everyone, for bearing with us for that technical hitch where the audio got um, lost a bit. We thank you that you have. Uh, given us your time. Thank you, Dr. Cliff, for that wonderful moderation. Thank you, Dr. Munene, for the beautiful presentation. Um, thank you, Dr. Kabiru, and uh, uh, all the other um, uh, colleagues for joining in our, our, our uh, discussion today and making it lively. Um, I think we have all uh, learned something new or uh, gotten reminded of uh, managing uh, orbital mucomycosis. Um, uh, and with that, I think we come to an end of today's uh, CME session. I uh, would like to thank you all for, for being here today with us. And I hope we will join us, we will, you will join us um, in two weeks' time for the next uh, session in CME. Um, with that, uh, you're free to log off and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.